Finally, the end of the pandemic is in sight, but the uncertainty about what comes next and who will benefit has thrown the market out of whack. You can be sure Ray Dalio sees through the chaos. Over nearly five decades, the hedge fund billionaire and investing legend has built an iconic set of principles for how to thrive in the market and in life. He made his first stock pick at age 12 and at 26 launched Bridgewater Associates. Now it's the biggest hedge fund in the world with about $150 billion in assets under management. On this episode of Influencers, Ray joins me to talk about what the COVID-19 stimulus will do to the stock market, whether the government could outlaw Bitcoin, and what worries him about a wealth tax. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Ray Dalio, founder, co-chairman, and co-chief investment officer at Bridgewater Associates. Ray, welcome. Good to see you, Andy. Uh, Let's start right in and uh, talk about the markets, Ray. There's been a tremendous amount of volatility uh, this year. Why is that happening, and how do you expect things to pan out? Well, it's, you know, it, it, it's simple. Um, <clears throat> you know how the thing works. If the pulse of the economy goes down, then uh, the policymakers like doctors, you know, rush to the patient and inject it with a whole lot of uh, stimulation. And so what they did is um, they wrote, wrote, wrote out a bunch of checks and they're writing out a lot of checks, which are about about seven times, five to seven times the size of the whole, and they got that money out. And what that did was, of course, the government doesn't have money. The, they can't print money, they, so they have to borrow that money, but the Federal Reserve can print money. And so the same thing that is happening, <clears throat> um, like on March 5th, 1933, is the same thing now in terms of that big stimulation. So the way it works is real interest rates are so bad, money's so cheap, and it's so abundant that it changes a lot of financial assets, and it causes those financial asset prices to rise. And when they rise, future expected returns go down to start to approach those of bonds and the risk-free return. And so that's what that's what we've gone through. So you you see it domestically. You see it also in the currency, in the dollar. You see it in um, other assets, gold, uh, Bitcoin, and so on. So what the world has got a lot of liquidity, and now we're at in a spot where we're going to have the supply demand question. The big question is uh, the supply demand question, because we're going to have to sell a lot of debt. And I don't know if you want me to go into that, but we're gonna have to sell a lot of debt. And then the question is how that goes, will the demand be there or will the Fed have to monetize more? That's the dynamic. Yeah, I do wanna get into that debt question, but but first of all, I wanna go back to stimulus, which maybe is before that. And am I to understand then that you think there's too much stimulus coming from Washington at this point, Ray? Uh, it, too, it depends, like you say, too much, too much for what? <clears throat> too much for the supply demand? Mm-hmm. Yes, probably. Okay, we'll get into that. Too much because um, like fast, a lot of people needed to get a lot of money. Okay, if you look at the needs um, and, and a lot of things like, okay, air on the side of too much. There was, you know, we have a, we have a big... Uh, wealth gap. We have a big opportunity gap. We have big gaps that are issues. Uh, we see it here. I work, uh, my wife, particularly in the state of Connecticut, works with disengaged and disconnected um, students, high school students in poor neighborhoods and so on. And you see their conditions and, and the, what the budgets are. There are a lot of needs. So I'm not saying the needs are not there. I'm saying just the way the machine works, the reality of it is 
um, you know, you're going to you, you, you're you're making this big supply demand move, but that it's not like it doesn't have risks and costs associated with it. So from the market's point of view, it's a real big deal. Yeah. So does that mean you, know, you sort of flood the zone to mitigate and obviate these sort of social problems and sort of by definition, you're going to overshoot and then we have to deal with those consequences? Yeah, because like like debt at the end of the day, it's going to be one way or another. It's either going to be when somebody borrows or, and you're using that debt, is that going to produce productivity so that in hard money terms that that money can be paid back in a way where, okay, it, it paid off in a productivity increasing way, or is that not going to be paid off? And somebody's always going to pay, but it's going to be the bondholder. It's going to be the cash holder who is going to pay if that doesn't come back with real productivity. And pr pr right now, it was an emergency situation with COVID mixed with a political situation to disperse a lot of money. And that's what we have. But it's not ending there because that's the new policy. So can I infer then that you're suggesting we're going to have an inflationary period ahead because of this, what you just outlined? There are two types of inflation. OK, there, let me just clarify. Yep. There's supply demand inflation, like if demand is pressing up against capacity to produce things, and maybe that's labor, maybe that's um, capacity constraints and so on and so forth, prices rise because of that. And then there's monetary inflation. And monetary inflation is because the currency and the value of money goes down. And um, so you can see, like in the 1970s, stagflation. You could see not inflation is not coming from the first of those types of inflation. Mm -hmm. It is coming from the second of those types of inflation. And the way that would occur is because people don't want to own bonds. To me, it's pretty crazy to want to own cash or bonds. Okay, we can get into why that is. But if you if right. you have that movement out of like that type of financial assets to other assets, which we are seeing, then that has the effect first of causing financial inflation. In other words, one investor, an investor shifts it to another investment and they go up in value. And then that wealth effect has an effect on those items that those acquire, people who acquire the money want to spend on. So maybe it's on penthouses or maybe it's on something else, but it depends how that's spent. I'm more worried about the monetary inflation which will, which would look something like a currency defense. Um, it, it means that what happens is as money, let's say people don't like bonds and then they start to sell bonds and bonds then go down in value because they have a capital loss and they don't offer anything in interest rates, negative real interest rates and so on. They don't like that. Then the Federal Reserve or other central banks are faced with the choice of either rates rise and that is bad for financial asset prices and it's bad for the economy, or they make the purchases, they make money and they make the purchases of that. And that then produces more of a monetary inflation. So it's the second that I'm more concerned with, but the supply demand of debt uh, will be, I think the big driving influence. And I, I wanna emphasize this, because so many people say, okay, well, here, they look at this stock or they look at this. But what you saw was the V bottom in all markets and so on. And that was due to debt and money dynamic happening. So that's the biggest dynamic to pay attention to. So wait, that V bottom, do you mean a year ago? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You could, yeah. On, yeah. I think it was April 8th or 9th. Mm -hmm. The exact mm -hmm. same action was taken basically almost as happened on August 15th, 1971, at which was also the exact same action which was taken on March 5th, 1933. In other words, the big jolt, the separation in terms of that value of money, that, that dynamic. And that is the new paradigm.
And so what does that mean? So on the one hand, you know, you're seeing this rotation in equities from growth stocks to cyclicals. Number one, is that going to continue? And then number two, the 10 years up, what, 100 basis points this year, uh, is that going to continue? Well, um, what's happened is that a lot of, like these cycles go, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of new ideas, new technologies, new things come along and they make fabulous revolutions and they, and they grow things. And that's great. Um, but there's a tendency of investors to extrapolate the past and, get, uh, and not pay too much attention to price. And when that happens, you start to emerge as somewhat of a bubble. Uh, by our measures, the bubble is not as what it was in 2000 and not what it was in 1929, but it's kind of like halfway there if I look at the, the types of uh, qualities. In other words, and so what that means from a value point of view, if you're calculating, you know, what can I realistically expect? Um, you, um, it's expected returns shrink relative to the others. However, the um, kind of the meat and potatoes type of companies uh, didn't benefit as much from those. And, and they're fairly stable and so on. And so that's why you're starting to see that kind of rotation. Now that can change, uh, it can come and go in these phases, like when people get stimulus checks and then you know, they might be hot on the, you know, the exciting things and they run up again and so on, but that, that, that's going on. And of course, uh, there's Bitcoin and other things that are going on. Um, so, um, however, the big thing is plenty of liquidity and ridiculously low interest rates. Now, on you ask about the 1.6%, I think we've been, we have been in a 40 year bull market in bonds. So now you look at that 1.6%, that's a negative 1% uh, about real okay that's a, so so you're guaranteed and you ask yourself if you're going to ho hold a bond any investment the only purpose of an investment is so you can sell it to buy something you want um and and so when you look at what is the length of time it's going to take me to get my money back if i uh, give an investment uh, nowadays, in the United States, I'm going to have to wait about 50 years to, get, to give back the buying power to start, and then I'll start earning money. If I'm in other countries, uh, some Europe and uh, Japan, I will, I will have less. And if I measured in all those countries in real terms, I'm going to have less money. So basically what that means if I, is if I just bought anything, that didn't appreciate in real terms. If it just matched inflation, I'd be better off than, than to have those things. And so um, now, I don't think those rates, um, those rates will only stay down there, I think, if the Federal Reserve does what it did it, like in the 1930s and the war period, which is to put a cap on rates to make um, in short-term interest rates low in relationship to the cap. Like back in the 30s and the war years, they made 1% was the short-term interest rate and 2.5% was the bond yield. So it was profitable to buy those bonds, funding it with 1% and you got 2.5%, that could put a lid on it. But because those two assets, cash and bonds, were such bad investments relative to other things, there was the movement to those other things still, and then the go government outlawed them. I mean, things like uh, gold, they outlawed gold. Um, that's why also outlawing Bitcoin is, um, you know, a good probability. And, um, and that um, they also established foreign exchange controls because they don't right, want right. the money to go elsewhere. Let me, let me jump in, Ray, because that, that comment you made about Bitcoin, I mean, so it's Two-part question. Is that in a bubble? Maybe three-part question. Is it dangerous? And what do you think the likelihood of the government outlawing it is? And is that even feasible? 
Bitcoin has proven itself over uh, the last 10 years. Um, it proved um, it hasn't been hacked. Uh, it's by and large, therefore, worked on an operational basis. Um, it has built a significant following. It is an alternative, um, in a sense, uh, storeholder of wealth. It's like a digital cash. Um, and those are the pluses. Uh, bubbles are financial assets that have imputed value. It's, it's an asset that doesn't have intrinsic value. It has imputed value. It's whatever we want, uh, think it is. Um, and if you look at some of the bubbles in the past, um, a great book is Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of the, Cl uh, of the Crowds by McKay, yeah. 1845 or something. Um, but it, he talks about the South Sea bubble and he talks about the Mississippi bubble and so on. It is when people love it. Um, it's the dot-com bubble and so on. And it, um, that, you know, that could be. So when you look at Bitcoin, it's a possibility, it, it, you know, it's an alternative um, because what there aren't many um, such assets. There are not some, so many assets that might have intrinsic value that can't be uh, messed around. As far as the government allowing it, um, the history was, um, you know, banks always used to exist. And then um, with the Bank of England, um, it, they decided that they, it was in their interest to have a monopoly on banking at a, at a country. And so what we did is we, uh, every country treasures its monopoly on controlling the supply and demand. They don't want other monies to be operating or competing because things can get out of control. So I think that uh, it would be very likely that um, you will have um, it under a certain set of circumstances uh, outlawed the way gold was outlawed. And you're watching that question arise in India today. India today um, is making the move to outlaw it, outlaw possession of it. Um, okay, so we have to see what that means. Now, can they do it? Um, uh, uh, now we get into the particulars. Uh, my understanding from um, people who are sort of in government surveillance and go on is yes, it's a, uh, they can understand, they can track it, they can know who's dealing with it. I don't know, like I'm not an expert on that. Um, but, um, you know, there's a whole way is, is it private wallets? Is it not private wallets? How do you do this, this and the other thing? I would suspect it would be very hard to hold up against that kind of action. Um, so that's what it looks like to me. Right. What do you make of, uh, how do you assess so far the Biden administration, the president, and in particular, Janet Yellen? Well, I'd say politically, um, it's a reality that there are two uh, political parties. Um, in both cases, uh, that um, there are uh, rather extreme elements to that. We can call it capitalist and socialist, or we can call it whatever we want to call it, but there's a range. And there is not much in the middle. It's difficult to be in the middle because they have to align with either of those. So in terms of, let's say, economic policies, generally speaking, there's not much, um, you, you know, it, it's, it's tough to fight with uh, both your Democrats and the Republicans, and what does that mean? Things like the wealth tax might be a litmus test. But in any case, I think that there is um, a big movement to deal with um, those gaps I'm refer referring to. So, I, so we should expect significant increases um, in taxes and so on in various ways. Um, we can get into our discussion about that if you want. Um, and, and depending on whether that's done smartly or not um, will affect the markets. For example, when we cut corporate taxes, that benefited stock prices. Um, depending on how the tax rates are changed and so on, that will certainly affect asset prices and, um, um, and capital flows. Let me, let me ask you about the wealth tax. Tell us what your, what your idea of a, a correct wealth tax would be. I'm a mechanic. 
I'm not an ideologue. I'm basically somebody who basically thinks if you move the lever this way, what will happen? That's that's basically right. it. Yeah. Um, what I did was um, do a study of um, all the cases of wealth taxes in different countries that I've uh, have existed, um, and look what happened at those. And I passed that along. I didn't comment on on that, but there are facts. Um, uh, which is um, like I looked at uh, 33 cases, um, and in none of those cases um, did they have were they sustained and raising a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, um, in in some cases, like Switzerland has a wealth tax, so it's a very small tax, and it was sustained. Norway has a tax, and it was small, and it's sustained. Um, those that are big um, uh, haven't lasted because um, of a variety of reasons. They're operationally different, difficult and so on, you know, illiquid assets. I won't get into all that. But um, there are different types of ways of, of taxing wealth. And so you'll see, mo uh, I think you'll see the easier ways to tax wealth become more popular, such as stepped up basis. In other words, nowadays, when you die, um, you get um, your, if, if your assets appreciated, um, you don't have to pay the capital gains tax on that and the inheritance tax. I think that's probably in jeopardy. And I think that you'll find different other types, property taxes, other things, they may come about. Um, but that's my thought on the wealth taxes in general. It, they also um, have um, a one, the big risk is, is this an environment that's um, hospitable for capitalism and ca capitalists? That affects capital flows a lot. And it's not just affecting American capital flows. Americans think it's just Americans. No, no, no. The, foreigners own um, way more bonds, American bonds, than Americans own. So um, it, just the whole notion of where to go, where it's safe market for capitalism and capitalist is, has an effect on capital flow. So those are the mechanics. Speaking of foreign investors, Ray, what is your take on our relationship with China right now? And how do you perceive it moving forward? Well, um, every empire rises and declines. Uh, for those who are interested, I studied this. I needed to study for reserve currency. So I studied this going back 500 years. And it's on LinkedIn. Um, it's called the Changing World Order. You can see the patterns. Um, and you could see what's happening. China is, uh, it has gone from, uh, I started going there 36 years ago. They were dirt poor. I would bring a calculator and give it to gifts like CEOs. And they thought they were miracle devices. Now they are in many ways in, um, in AI and quantum computing and so on um, at a comparable type of level. So China, by all measures of its power and prosperity, is a very, very strong um, competitor. So now you have two, the leading empire. 1945, we created the American world order because we won World War II. And so we had a new monetary system and so on. And now we're having a challenge of that, partially because of Chinese, but partially also how we're handling ourselves. I mean, we're not doing great in handling ourselves in a lot of the most basic ways. So yes, we have that conflict. In China's, um, I, I would say it's um, my, um, um, I've had a lot of contact there over decades, and I really believe it's just, it's an evolutionary process. There are certain things from the Chinese perspective. Uh, th uh, you know, they would believe you, if you can't suppress or compress me, you, th that would be their view that the United States is trying to do that. I suspect um, there will be tensions. And the question is whether, um, you know, one side uh, becomes um, too confrontational to let evolution take its course. But it's true that evolution is more on China's side than our side, although it really depends whether we can get our basics right. And our basics are things like 
um, broad-based public education, you know, the quality of education, civility of the people, do people work together in a civilized way or are they at each other's throats? Um, and, you know, uh, innovation and, you know, those things. So China, um, China is a very exciting place. If you, if, you, if, you, if you spend time there and you see what's going on with entrepreneurship, the creation of new businesses, new, uh, new, new investment in this, it, things, and there's an energy and it. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite something. Let me ask you a couple questions about Bridgewater and about you, Ray. First of all, Bridgewater, uh, it was a bit of a choppy year last year uh, for the firm. How are things shaping up this year? How is David McCormick treating you? Oh, David's a star. So yeah, you're, um, you're, you're referring to um, this transition, which is, I think, the most uh, beautiful thing. Um, it's, uh, it's not easy to start off and make a founder-owned company, let's say, founder company, to then be able to transition and to be sort of a, a mentor and, and CIO, but uh, and to let uh, the the talent rise. And I'm I'm very 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 lucky uh, to have Dave McCormick in that role. And we have a, a team. The investors, the um, Bob Prince has been with me. I think it's been 34 years, something like that. Greg Jensen's been with me for 26, 20, I don't know, a lot of, you know, decades. Uh, we will fight like hell, but we're together and, and so on. And so I'm, I'm at 71. And the most beautiful thing for me is to complete that arc. And, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. We're doing it together. So um, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's doing great and we're learning, but you're right. Um, the, uh, the second quarter, the pandemic uh, caught us. We, in prior years, uh, uh, we never had, um, I don't know how many years we had no, no losses. And uh, again, it, there's an alpha fund and a, and a beta fund, uh, but anyway, um, and um, in the first half, but uh, for the most part, uh, that all uh, rebounded and, um, and we learned a lot. Um, so, I think it's good. Um, I think it's I think it's good on all of those fronts. What about um, some of the the thinking that you're now famous for, Ray? Meditation, radical transparency, your principles. Uh, have any of those changed in recent history? Maybe because of the pandemic, changes in society. Um, what is your latest thinking when it comes to some of those? Uh, facets. Well, I just want to, yeah, the things you mentioned um, hasn't changed at all. And I really want to pass that along. At my stage in my life, the main thing I'm doing is want to pass things along that have been valuable to me. I mean, that's why I'm doing the interview. Um, and, um, and so meditation, wow, that has, um, you know, I, I started that about 50 years ago. And that has given me the equanimity um, when things come at me to deal with those well. It also uh, gives creativity because one goes into one's subconscious and that's where the creativity comes from. Um, you know, it's like if you take a hot shower, the uh, great ideas come to you and it's not because you muscle it. So that's been valuable. And this, um, yeah, the Bridgewater, the culture has been and, and is an idea meritocracy, in other words, let the best ideas win out, uh, in which the goals are meaningful work and meaningful relationships. So you're excellent at the work. And then also, if you have the relationships, that reinforces the work and it reinforces, um, you know, in the mission with people you like and you care about, that's powerful. And through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. Radical truthfulness means like we're going to be totally honest with each other. It may be brutally honest, um, but uh, uh, misinformation, because you've got this scenario going on in your head, but you don't really know what the other person's thinking is dysfunctional. And it also means that uh, you don't have, you don't build trust. If you're in a political organization and you know, you know, that that's 
that guy's acting really a uh, nice guy, high five and so on, but it's not going on the same behind the scenes that undermines trust. So those have been the things, the thing that I learned the best and I learned from failure. I learned from my failure, 1982. Um, I um, expected a big debt crisis that was gonna cause problems. That was the back, the bottom in the stock market. I couldn't have been wrong, more wrong. And that gave me the humility to realize that I, what I think in my head or what any one individual thinks in their head might be wrong. And the markets help you understand that. And so the idea of having others stress test each other with that right. radical truthfulness and that strategy transparency raises the ability. So I'd say whatever Bridgewater's success has been, it's be been because of that way of operating. It's a good segue to uh, my final question to you, Ray, and, and that has to do with your legacy. Would you want to be known as a thought leader or as an investor? Or maybe it's maybe it's both. I don't care what I'm known as. Uh, I don't think anybody will uh, will actually remember be anybody because think about like how many people uh, um, do you remember from um, you know a generation ago? Think about the rock stars, the movie stars the other famous people, they all disappear. We all disappear. The legacy, the way I view legacy is what is the gift that you're passing along? And the things that I want to pass along uh, in that are these kind of principles, like uh, um, how does the machine work? How does reality work? And how does one interact with reality to get what one wants. Those are what I mean by principles. And they don't have to be my principles. We're all on a discovery to try to find out what is reality, how does it work, and how do we in, uh, interact with it well. And that's what I, those are the things. So I, I, I wrote one book, Principles. I wrote another book, which is uh, Principles for Understanding Big Debt Crisis. I'm writing the other ones, which has to do with the changing world order, those principles. Um, and, and, and I'm writing these actually like for my grandkids. Uh, I mean, as well as everybody else, I've got them in mind. Like when I'm not around, um, you know, it, it can almost deal with anything when you're thinking about your job or whatever. Here's some of the things that might be of helpful. But most importantly, you should have your own principles and think about them well. So I pass along those principles like pain plus reflection equals progress and so on. Don't get caught up in your own head and have radical truthfulness and radical transparency. Those are Great, the most down, important yeah. things. Your approach to life, one's approach to life is the, is the most important thing. And when you start to understand that each person has their nature, what do you know your nature? And then once you know your nature and you're on a journey to find your click, find the fit that is the thing that allows your nature to flourish and deal with other people when they know their nature. Those are the most important principles, I think. That's what I'm trying to pass along. If it lives beyond me without ever me being referred to, that's be, that'd be great. Okay, Ray Dalio, founder, co-chairman, and co-chief investment officer at Bridgewater Associates. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Randy. I'm pleased to bring in our next guest, Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest and most profitable hedge fund firm. Ray is also a well-known philanthropist and an author of multiple books. Ray, it's great to have you with us. So nice to be here. You wrote the book Principles, and, and uh, it's a fascinating read. You're talking about radical transparency, thoughtful disagreement, all these different principles. And we're just having this conversation about, you know, how we are with each other and civility, bringing back civility. Are you optimistic that we can get there? Um, I'm not optimistic that we can get there, but I do know that we can get there if people are fearful of the consequences of not getting there. Um, I believe that if you study history and you see 
what civil wars can be like, and you realize that you could have a civil war, don't take it for granted that you don't, and you see that when people put winning and getting their way above all else so that they will distort truth, um, that they will uh, cheat rules, and that they will be violent with each other because, because that winning is of paramount importance that the whole suffers greatly and it affects everybody adversely. So, um, but um, I do think we're in a mindset in which everybody, not everybody, but I'll, I think the greatest problem of our time is people are passionately attached to their opinions um, and are not able as well to go through the thoughtful disagreement of how to get past those ad agreement disagreements and do things well together. I want to talk about uh, capitalism as well. And I know, Ray, you've done a deep dive on this. You did a study on this not too long ago. And it also ties back to education, which I know you and your wife are intimately involved in in the state of Connecticut, which if you look at that state has a, a wealth gap as well. How would you diagnose uh, the current state of capitalism? Is it broken? Yeah, the piece you're referring to, which is available on LinkedIn, if everybody wants it, is um, <clears throat> why and how capitalism needs to be reformed. Um, it, it, you know, it's kind of simple. Um, what are your goals? And is the system achieving the goals? Um, and um, I don't know that we could agree on our goals, but I'd say I would say the American dream, as I grew up and really believed in and benefited from, was the idea of equal opportunity. And to, in doing that, you would draw upon the greatest percentage of the population so that you would find out where the talents lie everywhere. And also the people would believe the system is fair. And so I believe when I look at that, I don't, I think the system is broken. Um, I believe in capitalism, but the nature of capitalism in various ways can produce these disparities that has to be dealt with. So education is a good example. As you point out, my wife and I, and particularly my wife, um, sees um, kids can't have the most basic educational um, needs pervasively. Okay, let me give you the picture in Connecticut. Connecticut is the richest state in the country and um, it has the largest wealth gap and um, wealth is concentrated in a small percentage of the population relative to the whole. 22% um, of the high school students in Connecticut are either disengaged or disconnected. Disengaged means um, that they have an absentee rate which is greater than 25% and they're failing their classes. Or disconnected means they don't, they don't come to school, they're out of school, they don't know where they are. 22% of the high school students. Those, where are those high school students gonna be like? What kind of citizens are they gonna be? Are they gonna be net contributors or are they not gonna be a net deficit? And is that fair? Okay, um, education. We were in a situation where uh, COVID makes clear that they didn't have computers. So we had to, um, and the state didn't have the money for buying the computers. So we, so we had to buy 60,000 computers for kids who didn't have computers and they don't have connectivity, okay? But there are so many, there's poverty, there's food as an issue in that kind of environment. So it's not an environment of, of equal opportunity. Now, why does that again exist? And there are not bad people who are producing it, but the profit system is not good enough to be able to allocate resources that way. In other words, not everything's gonna be able to be achieved by profit. For example, profit pursuit is logically, and for the efficiency of the whole system, going to replace people and jobs. And so it contributes to the wealth gap. It's smart for a company to have a technology that's going to replace people and jobs, but you get to a smaller and smaller percentage of the population that makes that technology and benefits it, and it produces that wider wealth gap. So that wider wealth gap also is an unjust system. 
Um, the, the t- what I found is that the top 40%, because I broke it into quintiles, top 20, each 20, and top 40% of the population on average spends five times as much money on their children's education than those in the bottom 60%. In other words, the majority of people has this, um, the elites spending five times as much money on their kids' education. The elites and, and the, and the ki- people below are want to take good care of their kids. They're not doing a bad thing, but that perpetuates an opportunity gap. So those structural reasons, not, not any bad guys, but those structural reasons are leading to a result that I don't think, A, that is, is either fair or that we want because we're not ta- um, tapping that talent. And it could lead to a civil war or, you know, some kind of revolution of sorts. So it has to be dealt with. And you have to wonder, too, how the states are faring through the pandemic, too, when you're thinking about just the the public education system and funding those things. How do you think that kind of exacerbates the problem and what should be done? Do we need more government to step in here? Do we need the private sector to step up? Do we need more philanthropists to adopt local public schools? What do you think uh, needs to change? Um, before I get to the what I think to change, I want to uh, build on your point of what is. And what is, is um, in a lot of places, and it's ironic, in the richest states, um, they have the most debt and they have the largest wealth gaps. So this is true not only in Connecticut, New York, uh, New Jersey, Illinois, you know, and a number of places. And that produces a a dynamic that has been, everybody sees it's true over time. You can't raise taxes because people will leave and and too much a burden. And you can't lower spending because it's inhumane for those other people. Um, And when you have a large debt and you have a large wealth gap and you have a downturn, you have a conflict. You've got a real problem. The United States as a whole has that issue, but the Federal Reserve buys, bridges the gap by buying the money, but printing the money and buying that gap, buying that debt. I think at the end of the day, the question will have to arise, will they have to do it? How will that question be dealt with? Because it, um, at, you know, at the state level or the local level, because it exemplifies what happens when the debt can't be purchased. Oh, and then, so I think we're in an era of a lot of monetization. Unfortunately, these all reach a point where um, it's an intolerable crisis. And then extraordinary measures come. And so I think that the path will look something like that. So what does that mean for my generation? I'm a millennial. Um, you know, my generation, I guess we're becoming the parents of today and younger generations. We're going to be the ones that have to really deal with the consequences here. What do you think the world looks like that we ultimately inherit? Well, again, I think you have to be savvy of what that whole cycle is like. That's one of the reasons I wrote that LinkedIn piece. So the changing world order on LinkedIn, if you see it, because otherwise you'll be surprised by it, I think. Uh, But I would say um, when you're looking at that, um, it comes back to the same fundamentals. Uh, Educate your children well. Um, Teach them self-discipline, character, civility, those things, to be strong. Teach them then to be open-minded, to go to read history or to hear from other people. Um, Teach them to be strong. Those are the things that you can give. And, and yeah, don't be naive. Don't be blind to uh, think that just the experiences that you've had are all you need. The future will be very different than your past because of the way these things go in cycles. The, the, the funny thing, I think most everybody expects the future to be a modified version of the present. And, or what they've recently experienced. And more often than not, it's, it's more the opposite than uh, similar. If, in fact, if you take every decade, the 1920s, the 30s were the opposite. 1930s, the 40s were the opposite, more opposite than similar. And you take every decade 
and it's more opposites than similar. So open the mind to that, strong character, well-educated. Those are the things at the end of the day that will serve you well. You know, I just want to read something that you wrote because it really it stayed with me. You said, quote, we are like ants preoccupied with our jobs of carrying crumbs and our minuscule lifetimes instead of having broader perspectives of big picture patterns and cycles, the important and inter in, the important interrelated things driving them and where we are within the cycles and what's likely to transpire. And of course, I think later in the piece, you even said that you're even just get, beginning to put together the crumbs, the picture here, and you don't have all the answers of course, and no one really does, but I guess kind of to round it out here, uh, what do you say, uh, I guess you were kind of outlining what our world might look like, but if you could narrow it down to one thing, what would be the biggest issue that we need to tackle first? Well, uh, of course, the biggest issue goes back to one's approach to life. It depends at what level you want me to answer the question, but, um, the biggest issue uh, is um, be radically open-minded. You have to make your own decisions and you have to make them well by taking in well, not by being closed-minded and, um, and having the character to do it. And then going back and understanding histories and, and how that the patterns of histories and then take in from the people around you, the smartest people you know, the information and triangulate with them well to make that decision. That is, I would say, the overarching at any time, the most important things anybody could do. As for now, I would say um, to realize um, that these changes, take a global view, take, um, um, make comparisons um, of countries, put things in perspective. And then if I narrow down to inv investing, so I'm getting more specific in ask answering your question, it would be first to realize that cash is not a safe investment, it's a very risky investment, and know how to diversify well. And when I mean diversify well, I mean diversify uh, globally, div um, in countries, in markets, and in currencies. Mm -hmm. How about, um, do you have a take on digital currencies? This is something a lot of young people talk about. Any uh, view on that? There are um, digital currencies. Let me break them out, down into two types. Um, there's the type w in which it's like a Bitcoin type of currency. That'll be an alternative currency um, in terms of its supply, demand, and an alternative storehold of wealth. And then there's digital currencies. That means there'll be, other types of currencies, let's say the dollar or the euro or the Chinese renminbi, that is digitalized. Okay, I think we're going to see a lot more of that second type, but I think that there are three main problems of the first type, the Bitcoin type of, of that. Um, uh, theoretically, it's good, but the three basic things are um, uh, a currency has to be an effective medium of exchange, storehold of wealth, and the governments want to control it. So um, I today can't take my bit Bitcoin yet and go buy things easily with it. And as a storehold of wealth, um, it, it, it's so volatile um, that its volatility based on speculation is so much greater that it's not an effective storehold of wealth. And which is also one of the reasons it's a problem to be a transaction vehicle, because if a vendor says, I'm going to get paid in Bitcoin, and they don't know what that means in terms of their other liabilities, that's a problem. And then thirdly, um, you know, governments won't, and when it, if it becomes material, governments won't allow it. I mean, they'll outlaw it, and they'll use whatever teeth they have to enforce that. They would say, okay, you can't have you can't transact the Bitcoin, you can't have a Bitcoin. So then you have to sort of be almost like, um, is it a felony? And I'm going to have to be a felon in order to transact. They outlawed gold. Um, you know, um, what's, what's wrong with gold? Uh, but gold was a storehold of wealth. And so if I was to say, what, what would I prefer Bitcoin to gold? Uh, no, I wouldn't prefer Bitcoin to gold. Gold is... Uh, um, will be the vehicle, there's either, um, 
that central banks and countries use as an alternative to the regular cash. Um, because each central bank can print cash, but through transaction, through time, when countries dealt with each other, they used gold because they didn't have to worry about being devalued by some country that's going to print the gold. And so it still is our third largest reserves, if you take central bank reserves. The largest is the dollar, the second largest is uh, euros, and the third largest is gold. So, um, but, oh, um, so if I'm dealing with classic currencies, I'm really sort of getting into the storehold of wealth d domain. That also includes stocks in the, that storehold of wealth. But I don't think digital currencies uh, will succeed and in the way um, people hope they would uh, for those reasons. Really interesting insights. And of course, you know, I would recommend folks read uh, The Changing World Order by you, Ray. And if you have any book recommendations, feel free to pass those along as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Julie. Ray Dalio is one of the most influential investors in the world today. He started his company, Bridgewater, out of his two-bedroom apartment in New York City in 1975 and has grown it into the world's largest hedge fund. Dalio is the author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Principles, Life and Work, in which he shares a blueprint for success, personal and professional. Dalio is an active philanthropist and conservationist with a special interest in ocean exploration and conservation. I'm pleased to bring in our next guest, Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest and most profitable hedge fund firm. Ray is also a well-known philanthropist and an author of multiple books. Ray, it's great to have you with us. So nice to be here. I mentioned at the top that you're an author of multiple books, and I know that you're writing one now called The Changing World Order, and you've been talking about three forces at play that were here pre-pandemic. Would love for you to share your worldview with our viewers and listeners. Um, yeah, I do, I do research, um, and so I, this is a study that I've been doing, and then I decided to share it with people because I think it's uh, so important. Um, yeah. Um, a number of years ago, first with 2008, we got into a monetary situation, of course, where we're printing money, creating a lot of debt and monetizing it. Um, and then um, populism emerged around the world. And um, President um, Trump, who was more of a populist, emerged. And we, it affected tax policy. It affected markets in a lot of different ways. And that uh, led me to realize that there are th at three big things that are going on in the world um, that are dominant. And then co COVID came along. Those three forces are first, the long-term debt and monetary cycle, which I mean um, the creating a lot of debt, monetizing it, and the implications of that, which reverberate through the system in terms of all the markets and everything. The second um, is uh, this conflict, this polarization, this wealth gap, and how we're at each other's throats. And I looked at the wealth gap, and I looked at a lot of measures of conflict going back in time, and I found that it, they were in the 1930 to 45 period. The printing of money, as I described, and debt monetization was also in the 1930 to 45 period. And the third big influence is the rise of China, so the rise of a great power, challenging an existing great power, the United States. And that has enormous implications. As an investor, I think, what are the relative appeals of the markets? But it, it has a lot of implications. It's not just a trade war. So the markets and everything were reverberating the trade war, the technology war, the geopolitical war in Taiwan and the South China Seas, and, um, and then also the capital war. We're seeing that emerge. So those three factors required me to then go back in history. And I, I wanted to study the rises and declines of reserve currency empires. So I needed to go back far enough that I would have a few. So I had to go back 500 years so I could see the rise and decline of the Dutch empire, 
and its reserve currency, the rise and decline of the British Empire and its reserve currency, the rise and beginning of decline for the United States and its reserve currency, and China. And that's, so those are the forces, and that's what I did, which you're referring to. And that, by the way, that's available for anybody to read on LinkedIn. So, so to recap, it's the high levels of debt, extremely low interest rates, um, the large wealth gaps and political divisions, and uh, the rising world power, which was China um, versus this kind of overextended power being the U.S. And I just heard you say, Ray, um, in that thesis there that you said this was the most analogous to the 1930-1945 time period. Of course, if we go back in history, we, we understand what happened. And that, that sounds really concerning. Well, it is, it is really concerning, and when I, it's even more concerning when I went back to find the 500 years in the times that repeated over and over again, and what I found was um, there's a cycle. There's a big cycle. You know, you start a new world order. In 1945, we began a world order after the war. They decided how the world would be divided. They created the dollar as the world's reserve currency and so on. And then, um, because there's so much fighting and, there's, and then you've established a power that uh, is a dominant power, you have a period of peace and prosperity. And then that gets extrapolated and it leads to more debt. Fear of bad times diminishes. Opportunities of borrowing and getting in debt, particularly if you have a reserve currency, because the world wants to save in that reserve currency. And that gets the country deeper and deeper in debt. And so you have those debt increases and you have bubbles, but you have prosperity. And bubbles are really fun. They're really enjoyable. They're great. But then you get to the point that there is a limitation to that. And those limitations start become apparent when the central bank can't easily produce money and credit. That starts when you hit zero interest rates, because then you can't do it the same. Okay, then you go to what, that's monetary policy one is interest rate monetary policy. When that doesn't work anymore, you go to the next type of monetary policy, which is printing money and buying financial assets. But that financial purchases of financial assets and other thing widen the wealth gap because those who have financial assets do better than those who don't have financial assets. And you have a wider and wider wealth gap. And when you have that wider wealth gap, and then you have another downturn in an economy, that's a formula for a lot of conflict. And so that's what we see. So what does a central bank then do? It, 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 if it taxes, it takes money out of the economy to, it's, that's not good, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And if it cuts expenses, that's worth, that's a problem. So the central bank always through history, this goes back literally thousands of years, the central bank um, or the entity that controls money then prints more money. Because, think of it, we got all those checks in the mail and we needed to get all those checks in the mail, but um, it, you, you can't take it away from anybody. So where does it come from and what are the implications? So that happens for logical reasons. And it often happens at the same time as there's a rising power externally as a competitor, which is um, a challenge in that environment. So yes, it's, a, um, it's, 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 it's one of those times. And I think people are not aware of it because um, I learned uh, from my experiences that uh, many things that happened in my lifetime that surprised me never happened in my lifetime before, but they happened many times before and in history. And that if I would go back in history, I could see that. The first time that happened was in uh, 1971. I was clerking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and Richard Nixon gets in front uh, of the camera and um, says, we're not gonna give you the gold and devalues the dollar. And, and, and I w walked on the floor of the Stock Exchange. I figured there was a big crisis and I walked on the floor of the stock exchange and the stock market was up 4%, which was the most in a couple of decades. And I said, wow, that's surprising. And then I found out that um, Roosevelt did the exact same thing 
on March 5th, 1933. And what was done in those two times is the same thing that was done on April 9th of this year when the federal government and the Federal Reserve decided to produce a lot more money and credit. So yes, you need these perspectives and I wanna pass that along, which is why I'm passing along that research on the LinkedIn piece. Yeah, and it's always interesting, especially when you mentioned a mistake that uh, 1971 on the floor of the stock exchange, what you thought was happening or going to happen, and it didn't. So you looked back in history and did this deep study. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to kind of double click on here, Ray. Um, monetary policy, you were just talking about monetary policy one, monetary policy two. And, uh, you know, when you think about what's happened, first you had the low low interest rates, you couldn't, you couldn't go any lower. So then you had to purchase the financial assets. You mentioned it benefits the wealthier, um, the wealthier because they own the stocks. So I guess, are we exacerbating wealth inequality here? And do we need a rethink of monetary policy that's more targeted, that actually can help stimulate those who really need it? Well, that's what monetary policy three is. So monetary policy one, is uh, interest rate based. Monetary policy two is the classic quantitative easing. Federal Reserve buys or central banks buy financial assets. Monetary policy three, which is now what we are seeing and what is needed, is um, the production of that debt um, through government borrowing and the government direction of those checks to those who need it most. That's what we just saw. And that being then monetized by the central banks. And so we're in a new era, okay, of monetary policy three, as I call it. Monetary policy three will mean that the free market will play a much less role in, in determining those capital market flows, that the government as we come into the, the future, we'll be thinking, how do I get that money to those who need it the most? So it'll be a highly political decision, much more political than it was in the past, and that the central bank then will monetize those political decisions. So monetary policy three means there's that type of co cooperation. So, you, so those are the two dimensions of the big, big change environment you're going to see um, much more government influence and direction of where money goes, which will have a big impact on not only the economy, but of markets. You have to watch what they're gonna spend their money on, and they have to watch where they're gonna get their money from, what taxes and so on means. The government will play a bigger, bigger role. And it also means that there'll be much more debt that is monetized. And that has implications for the value of financial assets. It has impl implications for the value of the currencies and so on. Let's unpack that further, the monetization of the debt the, the, and what the implications could be. I mean, you're talking about, you know, of course, when we think about the U.S., we have the world's reserve currency. That sounds like that status is very much, uh, I guess, is it under threat here? Is that what you're essentially saying? Yes. Um, if you look at those arcs, there are many characteristics of those, but um, when you get to the end of the arc, um, if money is hard, when it was connected to gold or it was gold, they always broke that link. Um, and, they and if it was soft, they would always print more money. And you can't raise living standards by, raise, by printing more money. You can redistribute it. Certainly the money, that is being received by those in the form of checks and they go out and spend it, helps their living standards. But it, what it does is it diminishes the value of that cash and it diminishes the value of bonds because bonds are a promise to receive a lot of currency. And it shifts wealth to financial assets. It always sends stocks higher, like my 1971 level lesson. It always sends gold higher. And it also always shifts uh, the impact of currency. So when we're looking at this, um, we're going to also see, I think, the rise of the, the increased importance of China's renminbi as a currency. It's got a long way to go before it's going to be a reserve currency. But I think that one of the important things to see 
is that you're going to see favorable capital flows for China. And, you're, and if you do a comparison of their markets, what, where their interest rates are, where their capital markets, who's doing IPOs, you know, nearly half of the IPOs, depending, we'll find out, but something like 45% of the IPOs that there will be done in China's markets, Shanghai and Hong Kong this year, new offerings, that'll drive cap. And more and more, you're going to see the internationalization of the RMB you're gonna see capital flows move in those directions. And those kind of analogous movements have repeated through history. And then I guess tying it back to, you know, the investors who are watching, a lot of retail investors, a lot of folks who are my generation as well, how should they be thinking about this? It sounds like, you know, the kind of, I guess the outperformance that we've seen in the US stock market for so long, they need to kind of think beyond the US. Is that what I'm also hearing? Well, I think first, the most important thing um, is to realize first, uh, cash is a risky asset. Um, I think so many people think if I go to cash, I'm going to be safe because it's much less volatile. But please realize in this environment of producing a lot more cash, uh, the real returns go down. It's a seductive um, risk, risky asset because let's say relative to inflation, you might get taxed 2% a year. And as you're taxed 2% a year, that's a huge amount of money over time, but it's a subtle tax. So first, watch that. Think about, okay, currency issue or the value of money issue. Then in terms of that, yes, you want to diversify to storeholds of wealth. And it, what it, the number one, the second big thing is diversify well. Diversify well um, into um, diversify of asset classes, but diversify of countries, diversify currencies. So think about diversification. If you diversify well, you lower your risk without lowering your expected returns, if you know how to do, do that well. But I would say, you know, uh, what are the three main things? I don't know. Diversify, 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 I would say. Um, so I would say those would be kind of the main headlines um, that I'd like to pass. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we're heading into an election and it's just a matter of days. And you have to wonder some of the themes that we've talked about here, whether it's the, the wealth gaps, the political gaps, the, the, the um, populist on, on the left and the right. How do you think about the election and I guess the scenarios, the probabilities and how that might play into some of these bigger themes that we have talked about earlier. Um, well, first of all, uh, I think like, what is the most important thing for the United States? Um, and I think um, the, the most important thing of the United States uh, is to do the fundamental things right. We'll talk about that in a second. And also to come together I'm, I'm, I'm most concerned about one side trying to beat the other side um, and doing damage because history has shown that when you get those gaps, uh, those uh, wealth gaps and the values gaps and anger, you do get demonstrations, you get, do get violence, and you can move to the point that the respect for the system uh, is not good. I have a you know, principle, which is when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. So the, the bringing, it, bringing it together and making sure that we can do that, I think is of paramount importance. Then what are the fundamentals? The fundamentals, there's so many important fundamentals, but let me go through the important ones. Um, are you going to earn more than you spend? so that you're going to build, to, we as a country, are we going to earn more than we spend so that we build our balance sheets? Um, that's important for every individual, for every company, for every organization, and for every government. Uh, you can judge the health, by, the financial health by those things. Then you have to go to the fundamentals that produce those things. And they start with educating your children well, broad-based, I think, good broad-based, good public education, and civility. When I say education, I don't just mean, uh, do you know how to 
read and write and all of those things, that's very important, of course, but also to behave civilly with each other because societies that row in the same direction with a common mission, like an American dream, uh, work better. And so I believe uh, it starts with education and, and, you know, the basics, basically. Not what I was lucky to have. I went to a public school. I had parents who cared for me, and took, loved me, and took, took, taught me some values. And so much. Those things are the most important fundamentals. Save more than, you know, those things. If we can do that, that will be the most important thing because wherever we are in, in relation to China or any place, is going to be dependent on how we are with ourselves to do those fundamental things correctly. Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater Associates, thank you so much.